Uh, hello, can you hear me, everyone? Yeah? So, well, my name is Jorge Gilcate. I'm Peruvian. Let me just put my name there. Yeah, everyone can see it. Well, I'm Peruvian. I work in Norway. I'm part of the middleware team in Cisco AS. Okay, we do mainly backend development and data integration applications. Okay, and I do a bit of open source contribution uh, to the Apache Kafka project mainly. Okay, so I'm here today to tell you about my experience with distributed tracing. Okay, but uh, first, to, uh, before going into distributed tracing, I would like to take a step back and, and uh, talk a bit about where distributed tracing is part of. So once I start working with distributed tracing, I get into the topic called observability. Someone knows what observability is? Okay, observability is basically having the power to not only answer questions like uh, if your service is up or not, or what's the response time. So if you put outside of your process and just check that your process is running okay, but actually be able to answer questions uh, much more specific, much more granular about the behavior of your, of your system. So it's uh, questions like the one that is in the, in the title of the talk, that is, uh, what happened with this message? Did the message arrive to the right uh, repository or to the right database? And if not, what happened in the middle? Okay, so my experience basically has been with data integration applications. So I basically have to communicate different sources with one or many uh, different destinations or sinks. Okay, so once you start developing it, uh, the development and the testing, everything goes well. You can deploy it. You know how many integrations you have. But once you are into production and once the, nimo, the, the number of the applications goes out of your hand, it's very difficult to actually figure out how things are going. So I usually, once I put things into production, one of the clients of the sources come and say, oh, what happened with this product that didn't arrive to this ERP system or it didn't arrive to this database? So once you have a small number of applications, it's easy, right? You can go to a log file, you can go to one database and check that everything goes well on why it didn't go as well and just fix the back. But once the number of the applications is actually growing and it gets out of your hand and actually you are not owning the destination system, it's very difficult to figure out uh, what is going on. So you have to go to not only one, but many different files, not only one, but many different databases. Okay, so that's basically how did I get into, into tracing. Okay, so I want to explain a bit about, about it. And it's not only, tracing is not the only way to actually achieve observability, but you could actually also use a couple of more methods. One of them is logging. I think that's the one that we use the most. And the other one is metrics. Okay, so these three methods are called the three pillars of uh, observability. So the three pillars to get the power to be able to uh, have the right answers when you get questions like this, okay? So let's get started a bit with it. Uh, I would like to start with logging, that is the most, like, a common uh, method that we use. Okay, so I have a here a small number of applications. Well, okay. Okay, so the applications are developed. How many Java developers here? Yeah, some, cool. Uh, well, but the concepts and the tools that we use are not only for Java, so you can use it with Go, with Python, with whatever it fits uh, your needs. Okay, so I would like to start first uh, showing how to trace a very simple application. So I have here an application called Hello World, of course. Uh, this is just one service, expose uh, the ports and the administration port. So if I start it, let's go here. If I start it, sorry, I haven't started yet. Start. start. Okay, it's up and running. Uh, let me just define my values. I would use Docker to just deploy the applications. So let's start this really easy one. So logging is mostly everywhere. So you basically, if you have an application server, you have a log file. Uh, if you're using something like Docker, you have ability to check the logs from here directly. Okay, so this is basically telling me what's the status and what events have happened in the application. So if I go, oh, let's, uh, let's increase this, okay. So if we curl this application, uh, it should give me some response, and some events should get uh, hello, uh, no slides. This is in Italian, this is all the Italian that I know. Okay, ciao. 
and uh, the event get re registered in the log file. Okay, so that's good. I have one application server. I have one process. I can go to the log file. I can go to the database and check that everything is okay. Once the component starts to grow, not only in number of applications, so yeah, I distribute this and I can generate maybe something like this. Let's uh, see how this looks. So yeah, I distribute this application. Okay, I put it in different services. So I have my client, I have my service, I have the translation service uh, around it. Okay, things start to become a bit more complicated to track. Okay, but not only if they grow in number, but they scale horizontally. So things start to become much more difficult to track. So let's try it out. Not the right one, yeah. So let's start this distributed application. Uh, yeah, it's like this. Sorry, let me just first remove what it was there before. Uh, down. Let me just clean up first, and let's start again. Okay, the, we, I have uh, three containers. Okay, all of them should be running. Okay, I can go to the log files like this. Box minus F, and I see everything here. So here is not only one, but the three components. I can start to observe one by one, but let's see how it looks. Let's clean up this. Let's go here. Here, actually, the name changed a bit. This is 8090. This is called Greetings. Okay. So I have the event here. Let's go do it again. I just generate another event. So. In this case, this one is uh, the three servers are being called between them. What happens if I scale uh, one of those? Things start to become a bit, a bit messier uh, to, to follow, okay? Uh, service, okay, up to five nodes. Okay, we'll start five instances in that server. If I go to the logs, it starts to become much more difficult to follow and to create the context in your head, right? Because you actually need a lot of time working with the same application uh, to actually go to the log files and understand what's going on and make the correlation between events in your head, basically. Okay, so that's how logs uh, are helpful. Uh, but actually, when you have this kind of distributed, in this case, this is running one machine, but sometimes it's running several machines in a cluster. So the good practice or the, the tools that we can use there to, to actually make things our lives a bit easier is uh, log aggregation, so we can configure um, Something like, uh, just show you here. So I have a version of this application with logging. So in this case, instead of uh, logging to the log, so Docker manage the uh, I use a log aggregator like FluentD. That is one of the many log aggregators that you can use uh, to actually receive the log and put that log into a repository so I can see all the logs in one uh, central repository and make my life a bit easier. Okay, so a couple of recommendations about logs. Uh, I will show you how this works. Uh, but let me just first go here. So uh, Peter jo uh, Borgen uh, has a very good recommendation. It says uh, services should only log uh, actionable information. So it's a bit abstract, so optional, uh, actionable, uh, you have to define what is actionable for you. So I would say, let's start like logging our exceptions at least. And uh, from that, you can start to think what is very actionable. Uh, but not only to log to a file, uh, but if the event that you are logging is actually very interesting for other participants, you can put it into a log database, a log data store like Kafka, or if not, you can just return it as part of the response to your client. Okay, that's one of the first. The first and the second uh, recommendation here is actually from the 12-factor application site. Someone has seen this uh, website. It takes the factors that applications should follow if it wants to be called cloud native. Okay, so it has a mention about logs. So basically, it says don't try to manage your logs. Don't try to, don't try to manage log files. Just print out to a standard output and let your infrastructure handle the log. Okay, so that's what actually we are doing here. Uh, let me just start, uh, I will start my logging infrastructure here. Okay, what I have here is uh, basically FluentD. That will be the log aggregator. It will send data to Elasticsearch and I will visualize with UI. Okay, let's start this very 
uh, fast login app minus D. Okay, start everything. Let's check it's working. Good. Okay, now I can start the other application with the login enabled. So hello world distributed login app minus Z. Okay, it will recreate the logs, the containers, but now the logs won't be available on Docker, but it will be sent out to somewhere else. Okay, if I do logs minus F here, logs are not available, so I have to go to something like uh, Docker. This is the name of my Docker server, Docker VM, and choose 5601. Okay, Kivana starts. So I can come here and actually check what's going on. Now, and also you can not only send, but you can parse, you can create fields. It will be easier if you want to filter things out and it will help you a lot, okay? So that's the first tool, then we can move. So we have to be aware that the number of logs will grow as the number of the load of the system grow. So if you have more requests, you will have more logs. And you, if you have more logs, you will have more data to manage. Okay, so it could be, you, you have to be careful when you are using logs because it's really easy to create, but once your system has a, a bit of load, it will become a problem. Okay, so then we have another tool to achieve more visibility, uh, observability that is called uh, metrics. Metrics actually in the other side is an aggregation of events. So the number of metrics uh, or the volume of metrics, it will be constant if the load grows because you only have to keep the latest number, okay? so. Uh, one recommendation there to use metrics uh, starts with a red method. Okay, so first uh, have a metric for your request rate, then have a metric for your error rate, and then have a metric for your uh, that duration of your operations. With those three, you you should be good to, uh, a good uh, starting point. Okay, so let's see uh, how that works when we go when we are talking about. Uh, when we are talking about uh, metrics, we will need to instrument our applications to generate that information, okay? So that's when ins instrumentation comes uh, to play a role here. So I will show you basically how it works here. So basically, I'm using here uh, Drop Wizard. So Drop Wizard is a web uh, framework that helps me to develop easy uh, HTTP endpoints. Uh, so here I'm using Prometheus as, uh, as instrumentation, okay? So it will generate a context called metrics where I will expose my current metrics. And the instrumentation, usually uh, you instrument your framework instead of instru instrument manually your application because it could be costly, okay? And in this case, uh, for drug wizard, this is, uh, this is enough. No problem. And uh, well, you need to generate a registry. You need to import here the metrics that Drop Wizard generates. Um, basically, export those values in this context. Okay, I won't get more into that. So, basically, if I go here to Docker, Docker BM AD ninety one slash metrics. Nope, it's not there yet. Okay, let me just compile the, the, the application. How are we in time? 15 minutes, that's okay. Yo, uh, hello world. Yeah. Nope, one of it. Sorry. Okay, this should compile uh, really fast. Okay, I will package now the application with the uh, Docker Compose, minus F, hello world. YAML built. Okay, it will add the jar. Now I should be able to start this. Okay, let's take a look to the ports. Probably in this one. Okay, it's 8081, sorry. One. Okay, so this is the format that Prometheus is expecting. So Prometheus is a uh, metric database, okay? So it's a time series database, and it needs a configuration that looks like this. It's a metrics, 
Prometheus, Prometheus YAML, and it's a YAML file. So in this YAML file, you basically uh, say how often Prometheus should go to an endpoint and ask for values, okay? And then you say, okay, you should go to this endpoint. In this case, for the Hello World monolith, I should go to this uh, host, this port, and ask for the metrics, the slash metrics, okay? And that will be completely decoupled of your application. Your application just generates the latest value, okay? So it was, uh, let's start uh, Prometheus here. Here compose uh, minus F, APM metrics up minus D. Okay, that should go okay. It's up and running. So if I go to Prometheus 9090. Okay, this is the interface from Prometheus. You can actually create alerts. Uh, have a graph and start to try out what's the information that you have. So I just want to check the request rate, okay, the first, uh, the first one that I mentioned. So let's go to the count. Okay, this count will count how many times this uh, endpoint has been called. So if I do again a, a curl here, okay, and I wait for some seconds because the metric will be here. Okay, it will be around uh, IO. Yeah. So we can see here that the count is updated, but uh, Prometheus will take some set seconds to go there and, and ask for the values. Okay, so if I execute this again, I have the value. Okay, but that's not uh, good enough. I will just generate some load. I would use uh, swap UI to, to generate some load here. Okay, so I can see more interesting data. Uh, so to calculate the rate, because this is actually the count of the request, to calculate the rate is as easy as saying rate, okay? And you need to put the period of time uh, that you want to calculate. So it could be H20 seconds. Okay, and this is the rate of request uh, per second that you will receive. Okay, and this will increase uh, as we are receiving requests. Then you can use something like Grafana to put this in a nice dashboard and show it to your boss. Okay, cool. So this is metrics. Metrics are much more easy, much more lightweight to do because actually you won't generate every metric by request. You will just update one value. Okay, so let's move into tracing. Okay, tracing is like the third uh, option, the third tool that we have to increase the, the observability in our application. Okay, so to do that, I would use uh, Open Tracing. So Open Tracing is a project backed by the Cloud Native Foundation. Okay, the Cloud Native Foundation is where all the big cloud companies are, Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. Okay, you can see the projects that are available here. So I would use Open Tracing. I have used Fluent and Prometheus. So all of them are part of the same foundation. Okay, and I would use Jagger, but I will mention that uh, in a bit later. Okay, so uh, so open tracing is based on a paper from Google called Dapper. Okay, so in that paper, a couple of mentions they mentioned that there were two approaches that they uh, were uh, were available to follow. One of them was the black box uh, uh, tracing. Okay, so they that option is put in outside. You put uh, some agent outside of the process and it figure out by the messages that flow around the, the component what's the communication, okay? But they don't des decide to not follow that path because they say that it's not scalable. So they follow the path of annotation based, okay? A white box approach. So basically in that you will need to instrument your frameworks and your applications and your code to actually generate the data, okay? So to avoid updating every application that is in Google, uh, they focus on instrument, the frameworks, the RPC calls, the lab libraries to access database, okay? So that's how they generate most of the trace, so then they can focus on just add the, the, the trace points to the points that they, it matters the most for them. Okay, so let's go uh, through the API. This is with Java, but you will be able to do mostly the same with, uh, with any implement, uh, programming language that supports open tracing. Uh, those languages are here. Okay, so you can go JavaScript, Java, Python, Ruby, PHP, Object C, C++, okay? So the first thing that you need, I will simulate uh, the communication between two processes because distributed tracing is actually, you have tracing or tracing has been around a lot of time, for a long time, 
but uh, the basic uh, difference with distributed tracing is that you can propagate the context between different processes. Okay, that's the main feature of uh, distributed tracing. Okay, so here I have my process one. Uh, the first step is to uh, use a tracer. So the tracer is where you define which implementation do you want to use because open traces is just an API. Okay, let me just uh, increase this a bit. So in this case, I decided to, to use the Jagger API, the Jagger implementation of open tracing. Okay, Jagger was developed in, by Uber and now it's open source and now it's part of the Cloud Native Foundation. Okay, you can use Zipkin and there are other implementations uh, around. So choose the one that solves your problems. Uh, here, I will need to uh, introduce a tracer in my process. Okay, normally you have a tracer by, by process. Let me just increase this a bit. So let me just uh, tracer. So the tracer is defined, it's an interface defined by, by the API. Okay, and I will put the tracer here. And then with the tracer, you are not able to create a spans. So spans are the meaningful task that you implement in your project, okay? So in this case, uh, let's create a first, our first span. So build span, this is the main operation. Let's just start active. So this is just a way to create a span. Okay, and basically you at some point need to say, okay, let's stop, uh, close the span. Okay. Let's generate a, ra a randomness here with wait a bit, and that should be to get it started. Okay, so I need to pass one uh, tracer. So let's use this tracer builder to get a tracer. I need to put the name of the service that produced the trace. Okay, in this case, it will be process. Okay, simple enough. Okay, and to run this first, I need to start the infrastructure. Okay, I will just start it and then explain what's available there. So docker compose minus f apm tracing up minus z. Okay, how much? Yeah, very good. Six minutes for this. Okay, this maybe is not a story because there are many things to start again. Just the way that everything is. Okay, most of them are up. Cool. So now I can uh, run this to see what it happens. Okay, so now we are generating one trace of the main process. We can go to the UI. So Docker VM, uh, the port is this one. This is the UI of open tracing. Let's see. Just refresh and should have something called process here. Okay, so this is the trace that I get. So you will get a list of all the traces that you generate. The information, it will be very useful. You will get the duration of the trace. Okay, you will get the number of services. And inside your trace, uh, you get the number of the, uh, how long it takes to execute this specifically as the, this specific span. Okay, you will have tags and process. We will check a bit about it. child span, so that's kind of the second part. You can call that child operation here. Okay, so we are now, get, uh, we'll create a child span. So as this span same thread, uh, it will recognize that it's a child span from a parent. Okay, so let's do basically the same here. Okay, let's remove this uh, guy from here and yeah, that's it. And let's give a name to this operation. So this is a child operation, okay? So let's just run and see how it looks in a Jagger UI. Yep. So if we go here and find traces and you get the second, so if you go back a bit, you will see that the number of the traces and actually the circle here will grow with an, if the number of tracer grows, okay? And you can see the traceability. Okay, apart from creating tra uh, spans, uh, you can also tag, add some metadata to the span. So there are two different ways to do that. First, you can uh, add uh, tags, okay? And there are some uh, semantics uh, already defined for most of the tags. 
So one of them is the, the, span, the span kind. So this is the type of span that you are defining. So in this case, we will call this uh, tax minus. This is the server side, okay? And you can define in the child that this one is actually the client side. Okay, but apart from generating a span, uh, tax that are useful to filter out the, the traces, you can use uh, logs. So, but these logs are a bit more special than the ones that we see at the beginning. Because these logs will be in the context of the span. So you, you will get all the context of, the, of what's actually happening when you want to check the log. Uh, so let's add a log here, span.log, events, something happened. Okay, and let's just execute it to see how this looks. It's done. Okay, so let's see here what's going on. Okay, I see basically the same. Now I see that here in tags is a new tag that I have at. In the child, I can see the tag and I can see also the log. So you can add actually hear your stack trace and you will figure out to which it's a specific request it, uh, is related and you get all the context from scratch. So it's a very uh, valuable uh, tool. But let's see actually the, the most complex part. So how to do the inter-process propagation of the context. That's actually the main future of, uh, of print tracing. So let's create another process here. Okay, let's call it another process. New, another process. Okay, and let's create another uh, trace. This will be called another process. Let's just make this a bit more easy to watch. Let's create a class. Okay, and let's define here the trace. Tracer. Port. Yeah. Yeah, part. Let's define the injection. And let's basically do the same, void uh, run. Okay, and this will basically do the same as this, guys. Let's do it. Okay, we will create another span here. Let's remove this guy. Main operation, yeah, basically the same. And let's add this utility method. Okay, cool. So if I execute this here, I will get two trace, two different traces. Let's just run it to check how it looks. Okay, so I get another process, but it's not uh, referenced by this one. Okay, so to make the reference, to make all the, uh, those processes part of the same trace, you need to use uh, you need to, as a way to move the context from one place to the other. Okay, that's usually a, a part of the framework, the instrumentation of the framework. So usually you don't do that as part of your code. Okay, so if there is a framework for Kafka, you will see how to inject the context into a message and how it gets propagated. Okay, but uh, for, just for, to, to understand how it works, uh, let's see, in this case we will use a map Okay, the map is the, the basic way to propagate the state in open tracing. Okay, so let's define this. So in some way, imagine this is the HTTP headers, okay? So let's make the process return a map, and that map should go to be another process, right? So this one will receive the map. Okay, and that's how we will propagate a state. That's the, the, the context, sorry. Okay. So how do we propagate the map here? Let's see. Let's put map, let's create a variable. Okay, let's instantiate the variable. Okay, so there is a concept of injection. So the tracer will be in charge of injecting the context into the, into the map. Okay, so we can say tracer that inject. Okay, the span context. The span context is an abstraction of how the implementation manage the, tra the trace information, okay? 
Then I need a format. Uh, in this case, this is a very basic format that is included in the API uh, called text map. Okay, and finally, uh, I need to define a carrier. Okay, carrier is the, the object to, to put the map. Okay, so I put here text map in check adapter, I pass the map. Okay, so what I'm doing here is basically telling uh, the tracer to inject the context into this map, and I will pass that out to, other, to the other process, okay? So, yeah, I can go to here, and I will be able to print out, oh, sorry, this is, I will be able here to print out the map, okay, so out, that's print on map, okay, to see how, it, how that looks. And, okay, now we need to extract, okay? So inject uh, the context into the map, the map passed through the other process, now on the other process I need to extract uh, the value, okay? So let's do that here. So map that, uh, sorry, it's tracer that extract, okay? I need to define the format. And I need to pass the carrier. And I need to instantiate the carrier. And this is the adapter, um, struct adapter, and I pass the map here, okay? So that's how I extract the span context from the carrier. Let's see how this looks, okay? And now I can make a reference to that context. So we can do that when we create the span. So we add a reference, and there are two types of reference so far. One is child of, that is the one that we see uh, created when I have a child operation, okay? But the follows from is another type of, uh, another type of reference when something is asynchronous or just simply follows uh, the reference, okay? So here I put the span context to make a reference to it, and that should be enough to see the complete trace. Okay, we can see here that this is very uh, implementation specific, so it says Uber trace ID, okay? This is the ID of a, of the uh, of the tracer, and we can go here and take a look at this. Okay, now we see the two process part of the same trace. Okay, that's basically what you can do with the API if you're working Go in Python or whatever. Okay, so let's move to a more interesting uh, use case. Uh, let's hope that uh, mobile network works fine. So the Twitter was banned. So the idea of this uh, demo is, let me just go to my GitHub account. So I will show uh, two approach to develop the same applications and we can evaluate with open tracing what's going on. Okay, it's based on one chapter of a book called Design Data Intensive Applications. So what I want to try to show is I will develop, I have developed an application with this approach first. Okay, so it's Twitter kind of. So I will receive tweets from Twitter. I will write to the same service and that service use only one database. Okay, but the same service will be used to read the values. So writes and reads are in the same service and hit the same database. We will see how the load actually affects uh, that with open tracing. And I have another version of the same application that it will write first to a log system. Uh, this is Kafka. And then I have an indexer that we pull from Kafka, Kafka and put the, uh, the tweets on Elasticsearch. So the reads will go to Elasticsearch. So I'm trying to decoupling the writes of the of the reads, okay, and see uh, we will be able to see what's going on uh, with uh, inside of the application or with the traces, okay. So let's clean up this and hope everything is running. Okay, so I will start uh, two applications it calls tweets that service version one. And I will start also the version two. Service version two, ammo, app minus E. Okay, it should start everything here. Let's check everything is up. Yeah, looks good. Okay, now I have a connector to bring data from Twitter. Okay, uh, the configuration is here. Don't, don't copy my, my keys, okay? So this, <laughs> this is, uh, I define some terms, uh, some terms to, to actually bring data from, from Twitter. 
Okay, this is using Kafka Connect. But that's not uh, that important. So let's start the importer. Okay, the source YAML app minus Z. And let's see if it works because I had problems to connect to Twitter before. Yes. Okay, looks like everything is up and running. Let's take a look to the logs. Okay, looks like it's generating some random information. Uh, let me just tail this to see if it's actually bringing. Okay, it looks like there is not much. Let's try to start again, just to make sure. Okay, let's see. Okay, now we are receiving data from Twitter. Sorry if I spend all your data. <laughs> uh, okay, so we can go to Jagger. Okay, we will see the version one and how it's behaving. Okay, it looks very good. It's less than 100 milliseconds. We can see if the, it's growing. We can increase the number here of uh, 200. So we will see the, how the latency is behaving in this service. Okay, this is just writing. I'm not uh, pushing too much uh, the service. So writing should be handled very well by the service. But once I start to uh, execute a load test on the write side, on the read side, sorry, so the read looks like this. Okay, it gets the first uh, 200, I think, 500 tweets. Okay, if I go here and increase the load, so this will be uh, some threads around it. We can see how the service starts to behave. Yeah, we can see the latency is going up. For the, let's put, let's put the right. Okay, the rewards looks pretty okay. But the finds, yeah, the find starts to take more than expected, right? Like seconds to, to return our, res our response. And we can evaluate the other version. So the worker is actually showing the trace from, uh, so from the tweet up to the, it reached uh, Elasticsearch. Okay, so we will see how long it's taking to do that. Uh, this is worker, okay. Okay, this is the latency, it's less than 200 milliseconds, and we can see here how long it's taking. Okay, it's fairly, fairly far, fast. And in the version one, once I start to add some pressure on the reads, it starts to create too many connections. I, I should see some errors here, yeah. So I can find out if since uh, I can tag that the span has an error, so I can figure out, I can look up into the logs. So I have all the information here about the exception. Okay, so I need to open my connection, more connections. Yeah, it's basically my fault. Um, so, yeah. And I would like to uh, wrap up, because I think I don't have too much time, uh, just with a tweet from Charity Myers. It says, I think of monitoring as TDD for production. If it's unknown, unknown, you can write a test for it, monitor for it, add observability as debugging for production, give your future you the power to answer any question. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, did you also use the Git tool? Can you like make a comparison between the two tools? Uh, I didn't manage to try out with Zipkin. It should be just a matter to. I actually have some code here to show. So if you go to the tracer builder. Here, I uh, have the code to get a Zipkin tracer. Okay, so basically it should generate the same interface, instantiate the same interface. Okay, uh, you could find problems maybe if the 
the instrumentations are not supporting the same version of the API. So this is a project that it has maybe one, one and a half year uh, as an open uh, project, uh, open source. So we will get there that it will be that easy. So you just need to update this code and change your infrastructure. That's kind of the goal. Uh, we are getting there, I think. Yep. I have uh, a question. No, there is an open source, uh, there is a Jitter uh, community around open tracing, around uh, Jagger tracing, around open zipping. Okay, so you can just uh, jump and try to help to make it better. Yep. Other questions? Um, can you explain better the, the part where the map passes from one process to another one? Yep. So all it links together to yep. the tracing of course. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, to link together the tracer. Here I'm using a map as a transport, okay? So basically you need to, the API gives the concept of inject the context into a transport, in this case it's a map, uh, but usually it's not a map, right? So you can define here another format. So the other format that comes with out of the box is uh, HTTP headers. So you can inject the context into the headers of the HTTP request or response and you will get that value transported into the other side. So on the other side, normally your framework will deserialize and get the, get actual, the actual context. Okay, we can see that in the instrumentation from the services. So for instance, the index is getting the context from Kafka. Okay, so here, let me just check out, the, where is it? Okay, so I have my Kafka event consumer, so this is just a loop. And I'm getting the, here the consumer, this uh, for loop. I get the consumer record from Kafka and I use a utility that is called tracing Kafka utils extract span context from the headers of Kafka. And I can use that to make the reference. Yeah, that makes sense? On the other side, how yeah, to? Yeah, on the, on, the, on the UI. I will show us the links oh, between uh, yeah. the two processes. Thanks. Let me just take a look back. I will reduce this. To, don't hit too much. The worker. Okay, so this is how it looks. So this is one of the service, and this is another service that follows from it, but it makes a reference to it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you.